it's getting interesting because now we can actually even within the system start to blend between virtual humans and create kind of uh, a being that doesn't necessarily come from any one uh, uh, scan or real human because the source of this stuff is real humans. Welcome to Commando On Demand Insider, your fast-paced weekly update straight from Kim's desk to your ears. I'm Mike James, and today Kim talks with, well, we're very excited to have Henry Adger. He's the head of communications and research analysis at Deep Trace. Basically, they scan the Internet looking for fakes. He's going to tell us how they do it. Plus, is porn coming to a podcast near you? And Tailspin is a company that gives a whole new meaning to on-the-job training. Kim talks to Kyle Jackson. Tailspin's CEO about how they're using technology like VR to train employees for what they call soft skills. It's the future of employee training. Plus, Kim has this week's hot topic and a serious online threat to kids, especially daughters, that you need to know about. And the holidays are here, so you might need a little help around the kitchen. Well, how about a robot chef? We're going to talk to a guy who created a robotic chef, and we're going to find out when this technology will be available in your kitchen, and I'm going to give you a hint, it's sooner than you think. Plus, every week we give you trivia and ask that you don't use Google or Surrey or Cortana to get the answer. This week's trivia question, we all have a window or a Mac at our home. Almost 90% of America actually has a computer in their home. But go back to 1984, and that number was closer to 8%. So, from the early 80s to now, what do you think has been the most popular, best-selling computer of all time? We've got four choices for you. A Mac, an Apple Mac, that is. And B, is is it a Commodore 64? C, the Dell XPS, or D, HP 100LX. What's the most popular computer from the 80s until now? The answer coming up later in this podcast. And real quick, this is not the Kim Commando Show. Every week, Kim gives you the very latest tech news, tips, DIYs, and of course, we take your questions on the show. It's a lot of fun, and you can even go behind the scenes if you want and watch us record on the Commando community. Now, the only way to get that podcast is to go to getkim.com. Again, you can get the podcast or watch the show, and that's only available at getkim.com. And it's just a couple bucks a month. All right. In just moments, it's Henry Adger. He's the head of communications and research analysis at Deep Trace. Next on Commando on Demand. This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash ev9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. This is Commando On Demand, where we talk to some of the most influential people in technology, the innovators that shape the future, and trailblazers who challenge and inspire us to do amazing things. Henry Adger is the head of communications and research analysis at Deep Trace, and you get to meet him right now. Here's Kim. The reason why I wanted Henry to join us, because so many people are talking about deep fakes right now. And Henry, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. So deep fakes, big problem on the internet, started when? 2017 on Reddit, is that right? That's correct, yes. So November 2017, yes. And it was primarily dealing with porn, right? That's correct, yes. So the original subreddit or page on Reddit where deep fakes first appeared was exclusively dedicated to synthetically swapping celebrities' faces onto pornographic footage. So how prevalent do you think deep fakes are right now? Um, so right now, well, we are seeing an explosion in the prevalence and proliferation of deep fakes at the moment. Uh, in our recent report, we found there are just under 15,000 online, which represents a more than 100 percent increase uh, since the same point last year. Um, and we found 96 percent of those are pornographic. Um, so they are still compared to some other Internet phenomenons, fairly uh, small, but they are growing rapidly and affecting a lot of people. You know, I guess we should probably define what deep fakes are, Henry. You know, as we get started, I'm sure there's somebody saying, like, what is a deep fake? How would you define it? So that's a tough question. I would take all, all evening to give you a full <laughs> answer. I mean, 
it, it's hard to say because it's rapidly evolving to include new emerging technologies. Um, the use or the phrase I would use is, is AI generated synthetic media. So that is very realistic synthetic fake images or audio, uh, which is automated. I, it's generated by an algorithm based on, on training data that you feed it of real photos or real audio. So you can see a video online of somebody saying something that they never said. That's correct. Yes. So uh, this works with, as I mentioned, swapping faces, but then also uh, live facial reenactment. So you pulling certain expressions and that being recreated synthetically in a lifelike avatar. That could be synthetic voice audio, such as you can imagine this call right now. Someone who had got audio of my voice could train a model to synthetically generate speech, which sounds very much like mine or your own. Um, and also it could be uh, incorporated into the ideas of fake text generators as well. Well, you know, there was a, a story not too long ago about a guy who transferred like a quarter of a million U.S. dollars because he thought his boss called him <laughs> to pay a vendor. And it turned out it was a deep fake voice that actually gave him the instruction. And he did transfer 250000 when when the When whoever it was called him back and said they could use another two fifty, that's when he's like, hmm, that doesn't feel right to me. Um, I was reading something online this past week over at Newman Lab. I don't know if you've ever uh, looked at that mm -hmm. website. And they were talking about the responsibility of news organizations trying to decipher what's fake and what's not. And where is the standard and how do we prevent the proliferation of these deep fake mm -hmm. videos, especially as we have an election coming up here in the United States that, of course, we all know throughout the globe is very contentious at this time. Um, mm -hmm. So what is the technology that, that we can use to figure out what's real and what's not? Sure. So, I mean, you touched on a great example of, of how deepfakes can be used to uh, enhance fraud and impersonation attacks. Um, there have been multiple cases now which have been reported of, of synthetic voice audio being used to impersonate CEOs uh, to commit you know, mass fraud and, and siphon millions of dollars from uh, private companies. Um, and as you correctly said as well, Nyman Lab have published some really thoughtful uh, work talking about the responsibility of media organizations when when covering emerging issues, perhaps breaking stories to make sure that what they're reporting on is in fact real. Um, so, I mean, my company, Deep Trace, we're developing what we refer to as an antivirus for deep fakes. That is a set of tools for both monitoring and detecting deep fakes where the human eye can no longer do so. Um, so for newsrooms um, or, or political campaigns or multiple media outlets, that involves uh, using tools um, to, to scan uh, incoming media um, and perhaps also take a moment to think about where your media is coming from that you may be using in your reporting. Uh, that could be using other tools like reverse image search tools um, to, to kind of get a broader picture and forensic analysis of the, of the media you're consuming and sharing with your, your viewers. So if, if I'm just sitting here at home, is there any, are there any telltale signs of something that I may see on social media that I can look at and I go, mm, that doesn't feel right to me. So there absolutely are, but there's a danger in giving kind of people this idea of a silver bullet that you and I can access. Um, a good example of this is, is back in about November of 2018, uh, some researchers found that deepfakes were very bad at blinking. Because oh. the data that was used to train these models was mostly of people with their eyes open, as you typically are in a photo that you've taken. Um, the algorithm wasn't good at kind of creating natural blinking patterns in video. So lots of articles were written about how blinking was the kind of telltale sign for humans to tell what deepfakes were, or what videos were deepfakes. The problem is that the kind of people making the new technology uh, quite quickly trained out these, uh, these telltale signs of blinking. So people still have a false sense of confidence that, that blinking is a good sign for detecting deepfakes when actually it no longer is. So, so it's, we need to be very careful um, when saying this is kind of how you can tell a deepfake because in a couple of months that may no longer be the case. So really we're dependent upon the news organizations or the social media outlets who, let's face it, they haven't done a bang up job of filtering what's on their sites by any means. So when you see something online, and Henry, thank you so much for joining us and do appreciate all the intel that you passed along. But as you start seeing stuff online, folks, make sure that you're especially cautious of what you're seeing and make sure that you really think about something before you pass it along as truth 
because it may in fact not be, even though it looks to be true. Hey, don't forget these Commando On Demand interviews are also available on YouTube. You can watch the interviews if you'd like. And that's at youtube.com slash Kim Commando Show. Again, youtube.com slash Kim Commando Show. Still to come on this Commando On Demand podcast, the serious online threat for kids, especially daughters that you need to know about, and Kim's special conversation with Kyle Jackson. He's the founder and CEO of Tailspin, a company building the future of virtual reality in the workspace and helping to train employees. That's just moments away on Commando On Demand. Frankly, I'm surprised it's taken this long. With the rising popularity of podcasts, the New York Post says that porn-based podcasts have arrived. Sort of. Now it's porn podcasts. Now, while the most popular podcasts are free, these aren't. Porn podcasters charge subscribers $9 a month, more than HBO. Why the charge? No legitimate advertiser wants to be associated with porn in any fashion. Is it exciting? Here are some of the X-rated topics. You're the babysitter, hopefully over 18. The kid's dad's late. He's had a stressful night and could use a drink and some company. There's a new twist. Or a woman runs into her cute former boss at a bar. Professionalism held them back. Until now. Audio porn is just as banal as video porn. Can't get enough of Kim's tips, tricks, and tech news? Watch season three of The Kim Commando Show on Bloomberg TV, Saturdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, or catch the latest episode at commando.com slash TV. Well, you know as a Commando listener that technology moves fast, and it's almost impossible to keep up with everything that's going on all the time. And that's why there's Commando On Demand. It's our way of keeping you informed on the cutting edge of technology. Our next guest is Kyle Jackson. He's the founder and CEO of Tailspin. It's a company building the future of VR and changing the way people learn new skills in the workplace. Here's Kim. Traditionally, virtual reality has been associated only with gaming, but now big companies are turning to VR to make their operations run smoother and their customers happier. Imagine, instead of watching an outdated, boring corporate training video, you're diving right into a real-life scenario that uses natural language processing to create a realistic person-to-person discussion with virtual customers. It's very innovative, and joining me here on the Kim Commando Show today is Kyle Jackson. He's the CEO and co-founder of the company Tailspin, and he's here to tell us more about what's referred to as virtual human technology. That's right. Hey, thanks for joining me, Kyle. So uh, tell me, as we start this call right now, how did you come up with this idea? We started looking at the kind of broad trends of how are we going to use um, this immersive technology to help reskill people um, at the pace in which um, you know skills gaps need to be filled and and work is changing. So. Originally, it was very focused on, um, you know, process, uh, you know, based learning, objects based learning. And we started out deep in the insurance space, working with customers on teaching people things like how to investigate a complex claim. Those customers are typically dealing with, you know, some of the the kind of worst days of their life. And so it very quickly becomes a soft skills, uh, an empathetic issue. And so uh, we started getting pushed about two and a half, three years ago to be able to figure out ways to bring customers into simulation, you know, for the purposes of, of getting those skills, um, you know, at the same time you're trying to teach yourself investigation skills. And so we went, mm, okay, this is, this is a tricky area. There's a lot that needs to be done on, 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 you know, the virtual assistant side and chatbot side and, but um, let's give it a go. And so we started building, you know, um, based on kind of a set of requirements that were all focused around emotional realism for us, um, a virtual human in which you could basically start to talk and interact with um, to get that kind of practice as well. So you created a, a virtual human. Okay. So I'm sure when you decided to create this virtual human, it's like, do we make it male or female? What age? I mean, really creating a storyboard of this person. So what did you come up with? We started out with um, just looking at something that we believed could be successful at expressing emotion. And so that means detail in the face that helps to, to, to push that through to the user. So we started out with an older male uh, just to test the system and test the theory. And as we've now progressed, we have an entire, you know, the United Nations of, of virtual humans and ages and uh, all, 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 all creeds. So it's, um, 
it's getting interesting because now we can actually even within the system start to blend between virtual humans and create kind of uh, a being that doesn't necessarily come from any one uh, uh, scan or real human because the source of this stuff is real humans, um, real scans. Walk me through a little bit of the process. So you guys come over with what, VR headsets? Yeah, so the best the best experience is really being able to sit in an immersed environment and actually talk uh, to the virtual human as if you were there in real life and, and get it as kind of like a batting practice uh, simulator for for those types of conversations. And in VR happens to be the kind of like the best way to do that. Um, the system itself can be delivered via mobile and desktop and other things, but you, you know, you lose immersion just like, you know, a, a Skype call versus um, an in-person meeting. So that really depends on the types of skills you're trying to teach um, and how important like um, all of the other um, micro expressions and nuances of, of communication are to teaching that skill. Um, and that's where immersion really becomes powerful because you start to be able to look at all the micro um, gestures uh, and expressions that, that that are also you know equally important. So, do you think that this is required? Your technology is required more so today because we have well a generation that has never grown up on anything other than a phone in their face. Do you think that that this is the reason why your technology has become so popular? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, that's what we keep hearing from customers is that there is a generation of kind of digital innates that are used to resolving conflict via text or via you know digital platforms. And when they come into contact with it uh, in work, you know, they're not equipped to really know how to handle that. You know, there's no real way to practice a lot of these situations until you're in the line of fire. And so, you know, the idea that um, we can use simulation and use virtual reality to do that um, actually plugs a very necessary hole. So tell me a little bit about your customer base. I mean, who exactly is using your technology and what are they using it for? You know, we started out working uh, with Farmers Insurance about two, three years ago. Uh, and in since there have expanded across a number of insurance clients. Um, we've also been working in, in the kind of big five consulting world. And then we've started to see, um, you know, large learning platforms and, and some of the people who have, have had other kind of content and other modalities historically uh, become very interested in this because, again, the, the results... Um, that we've been able to speak about so far are already exponential. And it's kind of in that still in that first or second draft. It's all pretty incredible stuff. I mean, you know, when you're talking, when I saw your technology and actually it reminded me many, many moons ago, um, I got a job working for IBM and we went through sales training. And I'll never forget this because at the time there was IBM and then there was Compaq Computer. And so it was just face to face you know, mm-hmm. simulations and role playing. And my sales manager at IBM said, okay, you know, tell me why um, I shouldn't buy a compact. And he was the customer who wanted to buy the compact. And I went through everything. I said, well, you know, um, IBM's better than this and compact is this, and, you know, the processors and the price and the service and the warranties and good things like that. And then my sales manager who's training me looked at me and he said, there's only one right answer. And I said, well, what is it? And he says, you just look at the customer and say, you want to buy a compact? You buy a compact. You want to buy IBM? That's why you talk to me. So so that would be really hard to convey to somebody in text messages. I I see a huge success for your company and congratulations. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the areas that uh, people are pushing us into are are really interesting because we're getting into the, the areas where it's, you know, about managing the development of others. We have a lot of people who are entering, become, or are moving into becoming first-time managers, and they don't have the skills these these kind of required skills. And so it's having this big kind of halo effect. And so the technology pushing into those areas where it's helping people to learn how to give, um, you know, good feedback or or have critical conversations is is hopefully going to have a, a a real big ripple effect on on um, on things just outside of, of, of some of the more obvious use cases. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. I mean, the new wave of technological innovation in the workplace, it's really just incredible. And I've been saying it for months and months now, if you're in the market for a new job, learning how this technology works can really help advance your career. It's Commando On Demand. Have you got an answer for our trivia question yet? That answer is coming up in the next segment. And a robotic chef may be not far off in your future. That story is next on Commando On Demand. Over the years, I've warned parents of serious online threats to kids' safety. Today, one of the most serious. And if your kids, especially your daughters, 
Use Instagram. This is a message you must hear. Instagram's owned by Facebook, and both companies have a long, dismal history of reacting to dangers and abuses on its sites. A group organization labeled Instagram as a predator's paradise. These groups have collected hundreds of sexual and predatory type comments on Instagram posts of underage girls. One of the main issues is Instagram's picture-based format. It can be a haven for predators to groom and sexually exploit minors. If your children, especially underage daughters, are using Instagram, you owe it to them and yourself to look carefully at their accounts for any dangerous activities. Want tech DIY videos from people you trust? Go on over to the Kim Commando YouTube channel and you'll see why Kim's America's top digital expert. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a video. Just go to youtube.com slash Kim Commando Show. This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Gary Commando On Demand, we always want to let you know what your future could look like. And specifically now in the kitchen, a robotic chef. Here's Kim. Imagine this. You can't decide what to make for dinner. What you really want is grandma's homemade spaghetti, but she lives hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Well, what if you could just pull up her recipe on a touchscreen and have a robot make it for you? Exactly the way that your grandmother would. Now, I don't mean a robot like Rosie from the Jetsons. I'm talking about robotic hands with multiple joints and sensors and a sophisticated control system that can recreate a dish exactly the way the master chef created it. This is what the kitchen of the future looks like. And joining me today is Mark Olenek. He is the CEO of Moly Robotics, the company that is actually making this futuristic way of cooking a reality. And thanks for being on the show today, Mark. I mean, this whole thing started with an idea that you had, what, almost five years ago. And where did the inspiration come from? Um, actually, it's coming from my, uh, I think, from my I don't know, early uh, early childhood when I just have a lot of nice family dishes from my mother. And after I improve my gastronomic preferences and I start traveling a lot, I enjoy any cultures, any cuisines around the world. I start understanding the quality of food, how food could be different from one chef to another, from one continent to another, from one country to another. Yeah, I think that's that's make the first, I don't know, inspiration for me to build this product. Okay, so tell me about all the different parts to this robotic chef. Uh, actually, uh, to build uh, the same dish, first you need to build the same environment. So generally, if chef use some number of the object in the kitchen and some number of ingredients, you need to have exactly the same, ideally the same set to recreate all the recipe from the beginning till the end. That's why I think optimization is coming from tracking and understanding the processes and data around the cooking. And so the arms themselves are made up, I, I read, of, what, 20 motors? And then there's a dozen joints and 129 different sensors. Uh, how long did it take you to put all these pieces of the puzzle together? Technology is complicated now. It looks simple, but inside is very complicated. And the same, I think it's the same like a cinema. Just to look the cinema and to make the cinema is two different things. The same is technology. For now, we built very quick our first prototype, but in terms of the first product, it takes time. So actually, usually not less than five years. We try to squeeze it to four, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, so you had a master chef uh, help develop some of the recipes, and I understand the first recipe was crab bisque. Why was that? So I think it's a quite popular dish, uh, the crab bisque, and I think it's more, I think it's close to be Italian, but it's, I think it's French, mostly French and Italian. And so how many recipes do you think you're going to have? Uh, during the lunch time, we want to have around 100 recipes from the different 
chef from different countries. And also we try to put some number of the low calorie food recipes. So because now to make like a to optimize the calorie level is one of the big mainstream healthy food is also be presented. So we try to put a little bit from the different sides. So what do you think is the most difficult recipe that your robotic chef will need to create? Uh, it's difficult to say right now. So we definitely start from the not most complicated one. So we're doing now pasta, we cooking steak, we cooking different type of stew, soups, salad. But I think for now it's a bit challenging to try to cook some very complicated dish like a sushi or I don't know the dishes which like have a lot of small micro manipulation. So when the people I don't know doing some small I don't know decoration or cooking operation by the fingers. That is, that is, I think, the most challenging thing, which we are not doing right now. But it's a question about the future, of course. So you can start doing this, performing it, and train a robot to do things. So it's a question, it's a question of time and resources. Well, I, I really think you're onto something because I just read recently that in many cities in the United States, because of Postmates and DoorDash and uh, Grubhub and all of the rest of them, that a lot of restaurants are no longer opening up like a full restaurant with the sit- with a seating area. They're just opening up a kitchen with a pickup and delivery type of service. So. You knowing that that's like where the whole future is headed, and now you have the futuristic chef. Is the futuristic chef, is it, is it faster and quicker and less prone to error than, say, a human chef? I'd have to guess yes to all the above. Um, it depends. Uh, the question is, robotic chef cannot create any dish by itself. So generally, the human chef needs to teach robots to do anything. So this is the first important point. The second one, if you're talking about the, some home delivery from existing restaurants, in any case, you have some limitation based what is available around you. Of course, you, if you well, live in center of London or center of Los Angeles or center of New York, you have a plenty of options. But if you're quite far away, you can imagine, for example, if how nice will be pasta, um, which being cooked 20 minutes ago, yeah, and I'm not sure that you will afford this quality of food. So freshly cooked food is very specific instance from my point of view. So to make it nice, it's easier if you cook it just nearby you, so if you're sitting in the restaurant, but if you order it, it's pretty much different. So who do you think your first customer is going to be? Who's going to buy this robotic chef from you? A lot of people from young generation, then enjoy some technology, technology geeks. And I think early adopters, they definitely want to try this. I think from my point of view, we try to make it very friendly. The interface which we're developing is pretty much simple and navigate people how to easily operate the kitchen without any complication around it. Difficult to say. I think from my point of view, of course, this first product will be quite expensive, but any first product needs to be expensive because that's how the technology works. But at the same time, we try to be inside the existing kitchen price range. So generally, we are not selling the robot, actually. We're selling the kitchens. And that's why I think it's an important point. And it's a big difference between the company who built the robot itself or who built the application. So we try to build application and we try to sell kitchens. And how much is that going to cost and when do you expect it to be available? Uh, about the cost, is a little bit too early, I think, because we are not signing off our bill of materials uh, and I think we will announce the price when we launch the first product. For now, the launch date is um, around April, May next year. So we are looking for participating uh, one of the big kitchen exhibition, and we are now choosing the right place. 
Um, well, so it's it's a pretty it's a pretty innovative, amazing use of technology. I uh, frankly, I would love one, but I'm sure it's going to be out of my budget at least for the first couple of years. So, Mark, uh, a robot that cooks and cleans up after itself, <laughs> really amazing stuff, isn't it? It's incredible to see how technology can turn innovative ideas into reality. And by the way, if you'd like to know what's the next big thing in tech, be sure to stop by commando.com. That's the website, of course. And what you should do is hit the videos area. There's a section that you're going to love. It's called Future Tech. And it's time for this week's Commando On Demand trivia. All right, everybody has a computer, at least almost everybody in America has a computer in their house. But you went back to 1984, that number was close to only 8%. So... In the early 80s to now, what do you think has been the most popular, best-selling computer of all time? Is it the Apple Mac, the Commodore 64, the Dell XPS, or the HP 100 LX? Well, if you guessed B, you are absolutely correct. The Commodore 64 was first released in 1982. This game-changing personal computer quickly became the favorite of enthusiasts for years with what was considered at the time an incredibly powerful CPU and a price point that wasn't in the realm of absurdity. It was about $600 when it was first released. This PC was extremely popular, so popular, in fact, that it was produced for 12 years, all the way up to 1994, and during that time, at least 12 million units were sold. Although some estimates actually put that number closer to 25 million units sold. Regardless, the second best-selling computer of all time was the Commodore Amiga 500, which was released in 1987, and only 6 million of those were sold. So there you go. It's the Commando On Demand trivia, and we'll have another edition for you next week. And thank you so much for listening to the Commando On Demand Insider Podcast. Give us a thumbs up wherever you listen, and also make sure you subscribe so you get these downloaded to your device every single week automatically. Now here's Kim with some final thoughts. Let's talk about sextortion. Sextortion is a form of blackmail where the sender is demanding money or else the sender will release compromising photos or videos of you to your family, friends, and coworkers, and post the pictures and videos on social media. The demand usually comes as an email. You're not alone if you get one. The email was generated by one of millions of computers infected with malware that steals a computer's contacts and sends out the threat at the rate of, get this, 30,000 an hour. My advice, never send naked photos or videos of yourself to anyone. Keep your device's camera covered. I know so many people use post-it notes, but it's pretty easy to see through those. Black electrical tape, it's best. Keep your security software up to date too. All right, now the good news. In almost all cases, there are no compromising photos or videos. So ignore these emails, even if you know that there are photos and videos of you naked somewhere. And always remember, blackmail will never stop. Keep your digital know-how going. Find your local radio station that broadcasts my show, along with more DIY how-tos and tips, videos, free news alerts delivered from me to your email address, along with our Commando community, where you can blog and ask your tech questions on our website. That's commando.com. And I'll see you right here next week.